Hi everybody, Mike Avila here with Sci-Fi Wires Behind the Panel. Today's guest has written everything from in a rock band to write librettos for operas. She's written YA novels and she did an awesome run on Shade the Changing Girl and Woman for DC's Young Animal imprint. She's currently crushing it on Batgirl. I am talking of course about Cecil Castellucci. Hi Cecil. Hi, how are you? <laughs> Good. <laughs> Did you like that intro? Was that nice? I kept just a little bit about all the things you do. I mean, it's, I mean, I, I want to meet her. <laughs> How has the pandemic impacted your projects? You, you know, obviously Batgirl is one of your primary things, but it's not your only thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, has it impacted your schedule and, and plans for the rest of the year uh, in other ways? I did have um, uh, one of my Dark Horse books, um, uh, Frozen 2, uh, has been sort of, is on hiatus right now, you know, sort of like cease you know, stop of work on it. Um, uh, you know, I feel fairly confident that that one will come out. But there was another project that I was doing with Dark Horse that um, is on scheduling hiatus and, you know, pencils down. And um, and I don't know what will happen with that one. So, um, you know, that that's, that's, kind, that's hard, you know. And then for me right now, it's more like, uh, you know, a lot of pitches that I have in and, um, you know, sort of projects that, you know, I'm, I was hoping to like, you know, sort of start to sort of figure out what my next thing was. I, I had a big year last year with Girl on Film and The Plain Janes. And so, you know, I've been like trying to find what my new project is. And as everyone's sort of trimming their lines, that's sort of, it's, you know, that that's where it's affecting me is sort of like, well, what does my year look like? And what does my work look like? you know, down the line, you know, for the rest of the year, you know, Mm -hmm. once summer comes. And then also all of my events have been canceled, all my school visits, all my book festivals, all my comic book festivals, you know, everything. You you know, I think the first time I ever spoke with you was on a panel at San Diego Comic-Con. I believe that was the first panel that I ever moderated at San Diego. I remember it was a really big thrill and it was a fun conversation because I think we talked a lot about Young Animal. And it got me to thinking before this interview, like, you do a lot of cons, uh, and you not only go there and do interviews, and you and you do a lot of panels, and you, you meet all the fans, and you talk to your your fellow comics pros. How do you see things shaking out on the other side of this when we try to get back to some semblance of normality and, and getting back into the convention circuit? Because it's such a big part of the comics business. Yeah. You, you know, the fandom and everything it, it's such an important part, and I don't really think comics can survive without the con circuit. Yeah. But this is going to obviously change a little bit. You know, for me, I think that's one of the things that's really affecting me, um, you know, is that sort of dynamic of meeting people. And also, you know, I think a lot of people discover their new favorite thing when they go to a panel or they go to a Comic-Con and they they see something new or they they meet an, a, a writer, artist, creator that they've never seen before. They hear them on a panel. That's part of like how, you know, we sort of like, you know, introduce people to the things that are amazing. I mean, I think that that cons will come back. I think book festivals will come back. I mean, I think we're going to open up. But like I, you know, I think that we're all a a lot more hyper aware of, um, you know, sort of how we're, you know, we as humanity are a symbiotic, you know, like we depend on each other for our, you know, health. You know, I think that there'll be maybe like more things in place for that kind of safety, you know, but I, I do feel that things will come back. I think it's just going to be a lot slower than, um, than we think. And yeah, you know, my heart is breaking about personally about San Diego. You know, I've worked 13 years in this industry and it's, you know, this, I was going to be a special guest this year. It was my, you know, and was so. Was this your first time being a special guest? I was a special guest through DC um, when Plain sure. Janes came out in 2007. But even then I was like, I was like, I don't merit this yet because this is my first book. And like, you know, this is just like a encouragement for me to like become a comics person. And like, you know, so this t- this year, like 13 years later, I was like, yes, I, you know, I'm going to have a spotlight and everything. And, and of course, that's completely, you know what I mean? That's just like a small personal sadness. I, you know, I, <laughs> you know, it's not, I'm not like you know, oh, good. Right, but you're allowed, you're, not, you're allowed to be I'm grieving by that. it. Yeah. That's, I'm a, grieving. that's a big honor. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I totally get it. I yeah. mean, there's nothing wrong with being a little disappointed about that because I, I would imagine for a comics pro, being a special guest and having your yeah. own spotlight panel at the biggest show on the planet 
is a big deal. It's a bucket list item, you know? So, and it doesn't mean that it didn't happen. I did get invited, <laughs> you know? So, and, you know, and I'm sure that, that you know, I mean, I'm still going to be doing comics. So, you know, it's it's fine if it's, you know, in another just, 13 they'll years. Push it, they'll push it yeah. back to 2021 and that's yeah. it. But you handle a variety of projects in so many different spaces. Do you have a a formula or some kind of method to kind of compartmentalize your creativity to tackle, you know, a novel as opposed to a superhero comic and whatnot? Well, um, I guess it's kind of twofold. Uh, the first thing is, is that um, I listen to the story that I want to tell and I figure out what the best way to tell that story is. And then the second thing is, if I'm doing Batgirl, then I go back and I read everything. I mean, uh, right now with Batgirl, I'm halfway through the second volume of the Bronze Age omnibus that they did. But other than that, like I read everything that was pertinent to, you know, character so that I understand and I go back and I ask um, for reference things. So, you know, Jason Bard is a big character in my book. And if you look at the history of Batgirl, Jason Bard is the best boyfriend that Babs ever had in the original run. I'd forgotten about him until you brought the game. Yeah, no, it's true. He's, he's, you know, he's, he's got a cane just like he does with me, but he's like literally the nicest guy and um, a Vietnam vet, like, you know, has detective skills like he's great so that was really important because you know the Jason Bard that I was handed was a very different Jason Bard and I had to try to find a way to make him more likable when he had done such unlikable things and Batgirl hates him and it's really helpful to go back to source material and be able to pluck little things out so that I like the character that I have to make nice and then also you know I ask my editors like oh could you get me reference materials on Jason Bard or, you know, can I get all the Batmans that are going on now so I understand what's happening. I wanted to ask you, what are you reading during uh, all this extra time you have at home? Are, are, <laughs> in between writing your scripts and everything else you're doing, are, are, have you... Uh, have you have you latched on to certain books, certain comics and graphic novels that that you're you're leaning to? First of all, I found it a little bit hard to read lately. I'm a big reader, but I found it a little bit hard to read. I'm in a book club with the LA Kings, the LA, official LA Kings podcast, and because um, <laughs> I'm a hockey fan, and so um, I just read the book. It took me forever, but like, but um, I just read the book for that. So I think there's going to be a podcast about that. It's the Bobby Orr memoir. And then I'm very slowly making my way through N.K. Jemisin's trilogy. The first one is called The Fifth Season. And then Doom Patrol, the Grant Morrison one, because the world is crazy. <laughs> and that's kind of crazy. So that's what I've been doing. But I did, I did, because I thought you might ask, I did, I did bring what's on my to read pile so that you could, uh, you could see. Well, number one, I think, I think a, a book that people, like I feel like is a uh, uh, great is um, Cena Grace's Ghosted in L.A., which is about these like ghosts from different time periods in Los Angeles who are kind of trapped in this sort of old mansion. And this girl who's alive from college is their roommate. And so I feel like that's a kind of read alike to what we're going through as we're all kind of ghosts trapped in our own apartment. But this is what's on my uh, on my to read list is the Oracle Code um, uh, by Mariki Nitschkamp um, because it's, you know, Barbara Gordon. So, you know, that's my that's my girl. And then uh, and then I found this in my um, in my uh, in my pile of uh, in my bookshelf. And I thought this would be timely. <laughs> Required reading right now. Required reading. And then uh, and then. I, 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 this is, I just went shopping on my bookshelves uh, the other day. And this is the other one that I have because we're also in a Twilight Zone. So I got the, the Twilight Zone. So, you know, I'm keeping on brand a little absurd. <laughs> You know, some um, people have gone to the comfort food, you know, the, the 1970s superhero books, and then others are kind of embracing the the, the absurdity and the, the craziness of the times and, and digging into those kinds of stories. You're kind of like in the middle, I think, because the great thing about Graham Morris's stories is they're always kind of right there on that thin line between reality and absurdity. So that's yeah. good. Yeah. I mean, I have also been, I th like I said, I've been finding it hard to kind of like focus on reading. So it's and writing. Everything's taking me a lot longer. But one thing I've been doing too is um, I've been, I've been doing a lot of gardening. I've been like growing things from my kitchen scraps. 
So I sprouted some tomato seedlings from like some Ooh. some tomatoes that I put in some dirt and uh, some peppers. I had I had a bell pepper and I I put all the seeds in a pot and I got two little seedlings. So I'm growing food, you know. <laughs> On my Twitter feed, for example, a lot of people, you, you know, uh, argue you shouldn't feel compelled to be relentlessly productive mm -hmm. during this time. Um, and I kind of see a little value in that and not yeah. pressuring yourself to, okay, it's time to finish that screenplay or that novel yeah. that I've had in the back of my mind, but that's what you do for a living. Yeah. So have you found yourself more productive? Have you found yourself uh, having a little trouble getting the creative juices going sometimes? Because while well, I'm sure you're used to working from home a lot because you are a writer and that is your trade, I'm, I'm sure you took breaks and you went out for a walk to get some coffee and work out and whatever. And now we're kind of just all like, trapped inside. Yeah, I think um, I think it's really important to not have that pressure to like produce crazy amounts of work right now. Um, I know that like everything that I'm doing, you know, is taking me three times, four times longer than I usually, you know, um, do just because I think we all have this and we have to acknowledge we have this everybody has a low grade anxiety that's, you know, that's happening. So I've been um, trying to do, uh, you know, little projects. I started an exquisite corpse project with a bunch of writers. I instigated it. So we're telling a story backwards, you know, and so I'm instigating that. And then I found all these like weird, I'm going to show you, I found all these like weird vintage postcards that I bought from like a um, flea market. And so I've been writing micro stories. I don't have one here, but I've been writing micro stories and mailing them to whoever, an original short story from whoever I wants love that. one. So it's just kind of like keeping the muscle going, but it's not the um, the the sort of pressure of having to like finish a novel or three novels or a new opera or like something. But it, you know, it's sort of keeping the ball moving and keeping my muscles, um, you know, my, my creative muscles sort of tight. How's the Disney movie rewatch going? Oh, thank you. Yes, that is another performance art project that I'm doing in my mind. So my rule is it's just Disney, Pixar or um, DreamWorks. It's not, you know, it's not um, it's not Touchstone or Hollywood films or Lucasfilm or you know, Marvel just, or anything. Yeah. Just, yeah, the animated just films. Disney. And that's still going to be like 450 films. Oh, you'll, <laughs> oh yeah. You'll need, you'll need, an, you'll need another quarantine period to, to, to put a dent in that. There's a ton of movies. This could be, this could be a lifelong project. Which is the movie that you've watched so far in the rewatch that has surprised you the most? I would have to say Pinocchio. I really liked it. I hadn't seen that since I was very little. I mean, Snow White as well, but I didn't start with Snow White because I had watched it like a hundred times because I just did the graphic novel retelling of Snow White. Sure. Uh, and Snow White is great and it's, uh, you know, amazing. And I think maybe this is wh where my problem with Fantasia is. And also like the other night I watched Saludos Amigos. There's not a story there. Beautiful animation, but not you know, sort of a story that I can latch sure. onto. And I crave narrative. You can really tell that like, they are trying to um, expand their narrative horizons and that they're experimenting with things and they're experimenting with stories. Like Bambi feels like the circle of life. It feels like you can see the seeds of the Lion King in Bambi, you know? And, um, and so that I think is really fascinating. And that's why I think this rewatch is going to be like super interesting because I think you're going to see how like like how a creative entity, how creators create and how they get we get inspired by, you know, sort of what came before and how you have to learn some things and sort of experiment and like take detours and make mistakes and hone your skills. And so I think that's going to be really fascinating. Another movie question. People who know you know how big of a Star Wars fan you are. Yes. And it's always a question that I have on my list of questions when I, when I interview you, and I always run out of time before asking you. But you camped out for for the Phantom Menace. Yep. You know, in, in 1999, what do you remember the most about that? Looking back 21 years now, uh, what's the memory that you that that sticks in your mind the most from that experience? Well, it's funny because it was actually 21 years April 7th. That's when I joined the line. 
You know, I got to say it's probably the friendships, you know, I'm still, you know, um, friendly with like um, a bunch of the people that I was friends with on the line, like, you know, and, and um, that, that connection, it's just like, you you went through a thing together. And like, you know, um, so I think that's the thing that sticks out the best. Not the movie. <laughs> he didn't stick out. Yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> but my friend, my friends are doing a um, a rewatch. They're using Cast. This like you know you can like watch movies with friends or something. So they're doing a rewatch of uh, all the movies in order. So I I I missed the first one, but I did watch half of Attack of the Clones last night. And um, hopefully that, the second half because the first half is tough. Yeah. So uh, that was really hard, but it was really interesting because while I was watching Attack of the Clones, which I hadn't seen since basically it came out, was um, how much I was like, oh, I see where Adam Driver got his mannerisms. He was aping Anakin Skywalker, you know, like the way he's throwing a hissy fit. I was like, oh, that like makes me feel so much better somehow, you know? So you have this unique perspective that you were a fan of Star Wars first, and then you've you've written in the you you've you've been a pro who's, who's dabbled in in the Star Wars universe. We all know that there's a certain small but vocal faction of the Star Wars fan that that kind of makes things difficult for some Star Wars creators. Do you still have the same love for the franchise, having um, been on the other side of, of the fence? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think that like you know, even though I have like a push pull relationship with Star Wars, like some years I'm like I'm like oh yeah. I love it and some years I'm like nah who cares like you know it's it's always it's a it's ever evolving but lifelong love affair that I'm gonna have with it and you know maybe it means that I you know don't necessarily read every comic or every novel or you know every single little tiny thing but I love Star Wars. I'm always going to love it. I love that people are adding to the canon, you know, and, you know, whether I know what it is or not, like, I I just think that it's a wonderful, wonderful playground and um, love it and hate it. That's a beautiful relationship when you can be that passionate and spicy about something. My thanks to Cecil Castellucci for joining us today. And make sure to give her a follow on Twitter at Miss Cecil and join her for her Disney movie rewatch. And if you haven't done so, Please read Shade the Changing Girl. You will absolutely dig it. And if you dig these comic book videos, subscribe to our YouTube channel to get more of them. And don't forget about our weekly column at sci-fiwire.com.